Hello, everyone. So good morning to everyone watching us through YouTube and on Zoom. Uh, this is the second lecture for projects and seminar course on accelerating genomics. And today we are going to introduce the logistics and the responsibilities for the student to pass this course. Uh, so in the past lecture, we went through uh, how we can make genomic analyses more intelligent and what we need to uh, accelerate multiple steps of several pipelines. So we were focusing on read mapping pipelines or variant calling pipeline, but we also talk about other pipelines such as metagenomics, assembly, and so on. And uh, for those who missed the lecture, I, I recommend everyone to watch it again on YouTube. Uh, so it's already publicly available in our channel. Uh, you can use this link to access the lecture. It's about three hours or so. And the slides are also available in the video description and in the course uh, website. Also, as a uh, highly recommended reading, uh, I would recommend everyone to go through this paper, uh, which we published recently. And uh, hopefully we provide a very comprehensive overview of the entire um, journey for accelerating genomic analyses, starting from the very first step, which is base calling, which is really uh, sequencing technology dependent. And uh, in, in, in normally in base calling, we target different um, uh, sequencing data, including the alumina, which is very short, HiFi, which is uh, a bit longer than uh, alumina, but also accurate, and also ONT, which is uh, from Oxford Nanopore Technologies, where they have very long, ultra long reads, up to 2.2 million uh, bases. And um, it has very high error rate. And the error rate could be somewhere between 5% to 15%, depends on the chemistry you are using. And also after base calling, we have multiple other steps that we already explained in the previous lecture, as I mentioned. So if you're interested in knowing more, uh, if you are starting your PhD, for example, or master's on this topic or something related to bioinformatics, I would recommend everyone to go through this, this paper. And I would be happy to answer any question if you have anything uh, fruitful or any dis uh, things to be discussed. All right, so in at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, we are offering two project and seminar courses, normally for undergrads in the Department of Electrical and Electrical Engineering. And those courses mainly focus on hands-on projects. So we assign a project starting from the first week of the semester, and the student need to carry out these projects until the last week of the semester. Also, during the semester, we provide some lectures because we don't require the student to have any knowledge in bioinformatics. And we are happy to provide all needed skills, knowledge, and the things needed to, uh, for the student to complete the projects. And everything we provide in these courses normally are open source, publicly available with the slides, with the lecture, with the videos except the project details, because these projects normally are a part of our own research. So we will be disclosing them or open sourcing all these projects when they are completed and ready to be uh, or ready for publication, basically. So here are the links um, for this semester, but also you can access the previous semester. Here you can see the schedule where you can access the PDF and PowerPoint of each lecture. And also you have YouTube links to each, um, to each lecture. Either it will be live streamed or recorded. But anyway, all of all the materials are already uh, available, including the slides for today's lecture. So you can access the previous semester, as you can see, for uh, PNS Accelerating Genomics. We've been offering this uh, for the fifth time, but we also have the other course, which is PNS on Mobile Genomics, which focus on algorithm development. And also it was offered for the fifth time, uh, including this semester. And we were happy that the number of students are increasing uh, over the semester. And in this semester, we got a more than 50% increase in the number of the students, which is something good for us, but it makes us busy most of the time as we need to assign more project, mentor more students, and so on. However, we are very lucky to have a large team of mentors in this course, as I will mention next. 
So if there is no question, let's jump directly to the role of this course. Uh, what does need to be done and what are the objectives and the goal of this course? Okay, so what is this course about? So we will cover in this course, the basics of genome analysis. As I said, we don't require any student to have any knowledge. So we need to cover all these basics and set the stage for the student to start uh, successful or to carry out successful projects. And we will help the student to understand the computational steps of the entire pipeline. And when we say pipeline, we don't mean really single pipeline, but rather um, uh, mentioning the complete pipeline. So we have multiple pipelines depend, depending on the application you are targeting. And for that, we pick one full pipeline and then we try to understand what makes it slow or what are the things that cause a computational bottleneck. And then once we understand these uh, barriers to make the full pipeline faster, then we try to accelerate it using either algorithm development, better algorithm with reduced time complexity, for example, or even accelerated using hardware uh, platforms or doing both. So we either we have our own algorithm to be implemented, and then we ask the student to accelerate it on FPGA or GPU for this course. The other course project and seminar, Mobile Genomics, we focus only on improving the algorithmic um, aspect of the pipeline. But also, we may consider proof concept of crazy ideas. So we have some ideas and we want to sketch them and then implement them and see if they work well. And then we focus on optimizing them. Because sometimes it really requires some fundamental changes to the algorithm so that you push for more speed up without sacrificing the accuracy of the pipeline. Hopefully, the student will learn about existing efforts for accelerating one or more of these steps. That include our own efforts at Safari Research Group at ETH, but also include the other efforts from other universities, especially the state of the art work or the seminal work in this area. The student will carry out a hands-on project to implement and improve their acceleration effort. And as I mentioned, this project spanned the entire semester. So we spent like uh, 11 to 13 weeks on only doing the project. Of course, that include meeting weekly with the mentors and doing progress on a weekly basis for about six to seven hours a week, as I mentioned in the responsibilities for the students. All right, what are the key objectives of this course? So we have multiple components that we aim at improving the student's first basic knowledge, because again, uh, most of these students are undergrad in the second year or third year of their uh, bachelor. So we need to provide them the basic knowledge in genomic, basically, or in bioinformatics. So um, we pick either a genomic analyses or a pipeline of the genomic analysis, and then we try to accelerate that or improve that or even just focus on any application genomics or uh, metagenomics or pan genomics and so on all of them are related to what we are teaching this course so we will also focus on technical skills because um, sometimes the student they have good knowledge based on some courses they took in the previous semester in programming, for example, or a CUDA programming, FPGA programming, and so on, but they didn't do the actual practical work. So this is how we are going to cover that aspect or the missing aspect in the, in the um, ETH curriculum. And uh, we will also focus on enriching the critical thinking skills for the students because for sure they are going to face some problems while they are doing their project. And uh, to enrich that side, we normally focus on teaching the student how to follow a good path until they solve the problem. Instead of giving them the solution or the answer right away, we ask them to check some resources we know the papers that they may already solve this problem before, so we assign it to them and we ask them to read it, analyze it, and then come back in the next meeting, and then we check what they come up with. And then if they face a dead end path, then yeah, of course, we are going to provide all the needed help and the things needed to solve the problems. Hopefully that is going to help the student to solve any research problem in the future because they need to follow exactly the same path. And that is true even for life problems. 
So if you face something in the life, you need to follow some similar path to check in the literature or from some more experienced people and so on. And um, the, the projects that we provide in this course are basically based on our own research projects. So that is something good and not good in the same, in the same time. It's good because um, the, the student will be really um, knowing more about how to do research or what are the current research directions, and they will be um, going through multiple stages of research methodology, starting from literature review and checking the novelty and then what has been done before and then implementing algorithm that makes sense and having a real contribution rather than just incremental contributions to the research. But also it might be challenging, very challenging to us since this project is new, it has new idea, it may fail, it may succeed and so on. So we will do our best to push for the uh, success of the course and the projects, but also we have always some backup plans for any of the projects. So as you know, in research, things might go well, might not go well as well. So uh, the, 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 these projects, um, the sometimes they lead to research papers and the student normally will be as a co-author in these papers, which is something good and something unique in these project and uh, seminar courses, uh, especially the things that we are providing in Safari Research Group. Um, at the end of the semester, uh, once the project is completed successfully, then we ask the student to present about, uh, their, um, about their project. So that will be um, uh, the, the semester presentation where we invite everyone from our group, about 30 to 40 members to attend the presentation and provide feedback, questions, and that mimicking exactly the same setup we have in conferences. So that is an additional, um, an additional help to the students. So we're providing them a lot of resources such that not only they came to work on mobile genomics or accelerating genomics, but also on getting more skills that they need to do successful presentation where we do dry runs, improve the presentation before they go for the actual presentation day and so on. So as you can see, there are a lot of objectives, uh, even if they are not the key objective of the course, but we still we are providing a lot of things, a lot of great things to the students. And the main goal of this course is basically to teach the student or for them to learn how to efficiently implement one of the key steps in genome analysis on portable devices or small chips, small, uh, small hardware, basically, um, to do the analysis very quickly and in a portable manner. So in some, in some situation, you don't have access to a huge cluster to do the analysis. So you would really need to do the things on a portable on-site um, manner. And that was true through the pandemic, for example, especially during Ebola time, and um, in a remote location in Africa, for example, you cannot hold just huge PCs here and there and just try to do the analysis. The same thing in outer space, as we mentioned in the previous lecture. So in, in space shuttles, normally you have limited space, limited access to the internet and so on. And you don't want to wait until you go back to the earth to do the analysis because you may face problems in having contamination in the sample or you may lose the sample for good. So that in, in many of the other cases, you still need to have the analysis very quickly in a single chip, uh, silicon chip that you want to do the analysis very quickly over there in efficient manner, again, without sacrificing accuracy. The prerequisites for this uh, course first, as I already emphasized uh, enough, that no prior knowledge in bioinformatics or genome analysis is required. And we ask the student of PNS Accelerating Genomics to have digital design and computer architecture knowledge, um, uh, especially the courses provided by Professor Honor Motlo in our group. And um, in, in most of the projects, we really focus on C programming because it provides the highest performance compared to other programming languages. So that is a, re a requirement. But also we can accommodate students with expertise in Python for the project that require proof of concepts and so on. Uh, 
And these things, if you worry about this requirement, please discuss it with us in advance. So we can um, find some solution or some workaround. Experience in at least one of the following is highly desirable, especially FPGA implementation, either using Verilog, VHDL, or using C programming for Vitus tools, for example. And GPU programming, especially CUDA. Uh, we also require uh, programming in C, not in Python, uh, because most of these programming languages do not provide comparable performance to what we have in C. And of course, one of the main prerequisites is interest in making things efficient and solving problems. So we are not focusing on a project that it's already has been done and just we give it as a practice to the student because that sounds boring, right? So we don't want to give things that already solvable to the student, but rather give them something to learn, uh, really new aspects of the genomic analyses and also making good contribution to the community because um, having a novel contribution may lead to publication and may also lead the student to join us for grad studies in later stages. Once they complete this course and they complete their bachelor study, they may come up uh, with follow up ideas uh, and they want to join us for bachelor thesis, for example, or semester project or master thesis, PhD and so on. And we have great experiences in the previous semester with those. And some of the members even now in Safari, they were taking the PNS course before and then we decide to enroll them in our group. All right, so let's talk about the team or the resources that we provide you. So I'm Mohamed Alser. I already introduced myself in the previous lectures. I'm lecturer and senior researcher at ETH since uh, about four years. And um, we have also Juan, who has some uh, good expertise in GPU. We have John Fertina, who's doing uh, algorithmic acceleration and algorithm development in bioinformatics. We have also Joel, who joined us recently as a PhD student. Uh, he has been with us almost two years, but one year since he started his uh, official PhD, and he's doing nice work in bioinformatics. And also there are a large number of members, so I would ask everyone to go through this link and know them uh, better, especially their research interest. We also have Nika. Uh, uh, um, she is a PhD student with us, focusing on different uh, acceleration platform or hardware with an interest in bioinformatics. We have Max, who is doing his master thesis with us uh, on bioinformatics and different topics. He was taking the PNS and the seminar uh, course with us. And Julian, um, he recently, yesterday actually, uh, completed his master thesis uh, with us. He was working on nice topics and different topics uh, around read mapping and the variant calling pipeline. And um, we also have Arvid. Uh, who was uh, doing uh, research uh, projects with us uh, for a bit of long time after he completed the PNS course with us. And he's still doing uh, some research in metagenomics. We have Yunju, she's doing her internship with us on FPGA acceleration of some application bioinformatics. And Luca, who's doing uh, algorithm development for metagenomics, who's doing his master thesis as well with us. And uh, the, as you can see, this is a bit large team, but also we have large number of students in, in this course. So that's why we need this much of mentors, but we are happy to add more mentors if needed in case the project requires so. And uh, as you can see, all those resources are available for you for free, basically, for all the students. So I would recommend everyone to exploit this offer from us to do great in their project. Whenever you face problems, you can contact any of these mentors or ask your main mentor basically to get some help from other mentors and so on. So we have different flavors, different research uh, interests and so on. So that I, I believe will enrich this course, of course. So um, as strict requirement for this course or the things that we really expect from any student in this course is basically the attendance. So attendance is required for all meetings, especially meetings with mentors, which are done weekly, uh, most of the time. 
And uh, we, uh, from week to week, we start, we assign some learning materials to the student and we recommend everyone to study these learning materials because they are going to help you getting the full picture rather than just focusing on your own project, which is a small step in the full uh, story of genomic analyses. Uh, it will be great if you came to know the full picture, the full overview and where people might use the step that you are working on. And that give you better insights how to better leverage the things that provide data to your step. So there are previous steps to the step you are working, uh, which is a preceding step. And there are also the next step where you send your results to the, that step. And these steps to work the things in a better shape. So you need to understand what is missing, what is needed for the next step and so on. In this way, you can provide greater performance and greater results compared just focusing on that step. And that is true based on Amdal law uh, also, because Amdal law says if you have a small step in the full pipeline, you don't expect to have the same speed up that you provide for that step, because at the end, there are many other steps contributing to the execution time. And then the, uh, the, the end result or the end speed up ratio you may get might not, might not be the same for sure. So each student has to complete a project and that project we assign in advance in the beginning of the semester. And most of these uh, projects include already building, implementing and uh, writing some code and designing in case you have some hardware acceleration using OpMem or FPGA with a close engagement from the mentors. The, we ask all students to participate, especially during the mentor meeting ask questions, contribute with thoughts, with ideas. And this way, the course will be more interactive rather than having a boring setup where we assign tasks and then, okay, good luck, do the task and come next week. This is not the things that we want. We want really a, a real interactive setup for this course where the student also can propose some ideas, some nice stuff to work on, even if it doesn't sound good for the student, but we believe the student um, can uh, come up with great ideas that can improve the projects. And um, we, at the end of the semester, we ask the student to provide um, a final presentation, as I said, to the entire group. And we also provide a GitHub repo um, to uh, upload the code. And the code should be well documented and so on. We will provide more details on this when the time comes. Uh, we will help the project with good progress to get published in good venues. And don't worry about that because we don't expect students to have good experience in writing papers and publishing and going to conferences and so on. But we will do our best to help the student to complete all these um, the project that they've been working on very hard throughout the semester. And some of the students did PNS project with us. They decided to continue also working on the same project for one more semester or so on. And then they got a research paper or they already do internship with us or they continue doing masters and so on. And normally, at the end of the semester, we see the student who did, who did really well in these projects and then we contact them directly. But we also welcome any inquiries from ETH students or from outsiders. Um, the the course website for the um, uh, for the this course is already uh, out there. It's already active, and uh, you can see updated information over there. But also, the courses from the past semesters are also accessible, and you can see them by either changing the semester um, number over here in the link, or you can access them from the uh, second slide or so that I presented about the exact links for each semester. You can always see useful information in the course website, but we also recommend our students to use Glip or Rank Central, which is similar to WhatsApp that we use in our group to communicate between the students and the mentor, which is more efficient than using email, I believe. And we also use Moodle for some announcement and things that we want to um, spam basically or broadcast to the old students at the same time. And also we have some assignments over there, some quizzes, it depends on what we need. 
but also we use email uh, regularly for question and answer announcement and so on. So that's why we uh, recommend all students to check the GLEP, Moodle, and email frequently. Uh, the, for the project assignments, um, we already did that. We already complete all the assignments for all the students. Hopefully, uh, no one left out with no project. If so, uh, please send me email in case we miss your email uh, or your name, because we got the list of names uh, from the secretary of the department, especially for those projects and uh, seminar. We don't get their names through EDOS or the usual system that we have for the courses. And we ask you to study the learning materials before next meetings. And then we give you five days to enter your preferences for projects. And I'm going to mention more details in the next slide. And then we match your interests, skills, and background with a suitable project. So we have a pool of projects. Uh, and then we match some of these projects or one of them uh, to each student. In the previous semester, we used to discuss this with the student, so we give him a few options, and then we ask the student to choose one, and then we see whether it's really good fit or not. But in this semester, since we have really large number of students, more than 15 students we got in total, um, so we dictate the project assignment for each student, so to not have conflicts and to not um, take a long time for the assignment. Uh, but also each mentor is free to slightly change the objective of the project based on the student interest and so on. And we assign the project and put you in touch already with the mentor in the second week. And hopefully by now you're already doing good progress in the project since this is the fourth uh, week already. And we ask all the students to check uh, our previous uh, lectures we assign one of the lectures to the student, but you also assign this paper, which is uh, mandatory for the student to read. And hopefully that give you an overview of the entire things that we are doing in the group and also the trend, the current trend in research. Um, for the project assignment, we give uh, a form for the students to fill and the, we ask them to return it back in about five days. Um, it was two parts. The first part is just basic knowledge about each student, uh, the name, the semester, the, uh, why they are taking the course, what they are expecting to have from the course and so on, the time they are available each day. But also the second part was uh, the main focus of uh, this kind of survey because we want to understand uh, what the student they already have as skills and based on these skills we can uh, understand better their needs or the things that they do really well in this course and we ask them a few simple questions including this one uh, this uh, this question which is basically about the skills and the knowledge that the student have in pro different programming languages all right so um, moving forward, we ask the students to attend at least one lecture of these um, two uh, lectures that offered every week. So we have one lecture on Monday at 4 p.m. Zurich time, and we have also another lecture on Thursday at 10 a.m. And we ask the student only to attend one of them. In case they miss one, they can still attend the next one. Attendance is mandatory, and we will provide these um, lectures on YouTube. Starting from next week, we'll start lecturing on different topics, and we have nice lectures covering different aspects of uh, the, the genomic analysis. Um, and we ask the students also to work on their projects for about six hours a week. Of course, that includes meeting with mentors, including uh, attending the lecture that we provide, which is one hour a week. So we expect the student to work somewhere between four to five or let's say six hours on their project per week. And this time is flexible as well because we don't count hours, we count tasks. So we assign tasks and we expect the student to finish it in a week. And uh, as I said, meeting with your mentors is required. So you have to do it every week. Of course, that is to be negotiated with the mentor because some weeks we either don't have good progress or mentors or students are traveling, taking vacation, military service, and so on. There are a lot of things going on. And we expect all the students to reply on time on Glib, Moodle, and email whenever their action is needed. Okay. So 
at the end, the ultimate goal of all these projects, if you look at the full picture, having a large number of students in these courses, what we expect to do. So we are pushing towards having more intelligent genomic analysis. So most of these projects are working in that direction. Of course, for a the student, they may not see the full picture since they are not aware about all projects, maybe until the last few two or three weeks, because they are going to see the other presentations, came to know more about the other projects going on. But for us, we already know the path that we set for this course. And we try to do balance between the projects, work on multiple steps rather than focusing on one single step in the entire story of accelerating genomic analyses. We focus on making the things faster or making the things more energy efficient, for example but also the privacy aspect of dealing with the DNA because you don't want to reveal the donor or the identity or more information than what you are disclosing for, for example. And also we focus on scalability. So we accelerate one analysis, but how about 100 analyses? Is it taking the same time or 100x uh, one time analysis, for example? And in all the project, we try to not um, miss with the accuracy of the analysis, to not uh, compromise anything related to the accuracy of the analysis. Even sometimes we propose heuristics or kind of filters, and those filters, they provide false positive, but hopefully we focus to not provide any false negatives, so to not affect the end result. And in, in our paper that we always recommend for everyone to read, we always go through this pipeline starting from extracting the DNA and pre-processing in the wet lab or what we call library preparation, which is also something uh, unique to each uh, sequencing technology. And uh, we give you a full overview on this and how the things are working on and what are the limitations and why the sequencing technology cannot read your full genome as one piece, but rather as randomized fragments of your DNA. But also the sequencing technology, each of them provide a unique output. And the output could be images, pictures, just pixels, and you need to process these pixels or we have electrical signals represented as amplitude, which we call squiggle. And we have the PAC bio uh, machines, which provide two types of data, or basically it's one type, and the other type is after pre-processing and improving the first type, which is um, the, the CLR, and the continuous long reads, and the HIFI, or the circular consensus sequencing. And the HIFI is basically where we process at least 30 reads of the CLR to get a much more accurate consensus out of these data. And what we got from BackBio is the movie, which is, let's say, pictures, right? Because the movie is multiple frames per second. And um, for each of these sequencing technologies, since the output is different, uh, or the representation of the data is different, then each of them introduce or initiate the need for really different uh, step that we call base calling. So base calling, as you can see, there are three steps for each of the sequencing technologies. And in this base calling, we convert the row sequencing data, which could be images, squiggle, or movie, into the unique representation that is fast Q uh, representation for genomic data. And most of the students, they take the fast queue, they don't see these things, the row sequencing data, and they start processing the fast queue into later steps. But you also could access uh, some publicly available resources to download genomic data from some of the very famous databases, such as NCPI, um, could be RefSeq, for example, if you are dealing with uh, different species, viral data, bacterial data, and human genome and so on, or you could just go to the SRA where you could uh, get um, the, the fast Q data for multiple species, different species. We have also the, um, the another, let's say, duplicate of SRA, which is called ENA, where you can find the similar data to what we have in SRA. Um, you could also use some simulator to generate the data. At the end, your goal is to get the fast queue files, regardless of the sequencing technology or whatever the type of the data you have. And then you do some quality control to control uh, the things that you don't want to be presented in the data. For example, very short 
uh, reads in the file, 30 long or 100 long. Uh, for example, in ONT, we sometimes filter the things that are shorter than 1,000 bases, uh, or the things based on the base quality uh, score in the, the FASTQ file. If we don't want low confidence reads uh, that where the sequencing machine, we're not confident whether this is A or C or G or T, which sometimes we uh, filter out reads with less than uh, Seventy percent of confidence, but we also have uh, other steps in, uh, moving forward, starting from read mapping. Because as I said, all the data we got from sequencing technologies are randomized fragments of pure DNA. Even if we got very long reads, uh, these very long reads normally inaccurate. So you need multiple of them to uh, overlap and then try to do consensus uh, or majority voting, basically to filter out these uh, erroneous bases. And after read mapping, after you already locate each of these sequences in the very long reference genome, so you would do the variant calling, which is the ultimate goal of variant calling baseline, for example. And you would like to uh, identify where are your genome is different from the reference genome. Uh, what are the differences, how large they are, and what type could be insertion, deletion, and so on. But also there are many other steps depend, depending on the pipeline that you are targeting. So if you are doing metagenomic taxonomy profiling, or for example, RNA quantification or KMR counting, and many more, there are a lot of uh, pipelines over, out there. And each of them, they have their own steps, but also there are common steps between all these pipelines. For example, indexing. Indexing is a nice way where you can access a huge amount of data without being sequentially visiting every single base or every single bit in this data. So you build a huge hash table or suffix array or Boris Wheeler transformation. There are many techniques. And there is, for example, the recent index called R index, where you can access a huge amount of data to, um, to use it for containment search, for example. So we will go through this pipeline as an example, but we will also visit other aspects, as I mentioned, including privacy, genomic privacy, uh, how you can process the data without revealing the information or the actual content of the se uh, sequencing data, the fast queue. You don't want to give the fast queue to someone else because, or some third party that you are not, um, that you are not um, giving access uh, or you are not authorizing them to access these data because they could still, even if these randomized fragments of your DNA, they can still build back your DNA from these reads. And then from your DNA, they could reveal uh, way much information than needed. As we give you examples in the previous lecture with references and papers on, on that. So this will be the two lecture that we provide weekly, starting from next week, Monday and Thursday. As I said, uh, students are required to attend only one of them, but you are, it's up to you if you want to watch both of them on time. And there are many topics that we cover in this course. This is just examples from previous semesters, but we are going hopefully to add new content as we do every semester as well. Uh, again, I would recommend everyone to go through this paper, but there are also a large number of references that you can check if you're interested in doing research in this direction. I would recommend everyone to read these papers first, and then they can contact us if they have specific questions to any of these work. Uh, this paper, for example, tried to cover the full story of read mapping uh, for the last 30 years or so giving the full story and really give you the comprehensive overview about how algorithms uh, are developed over the time while sequencing technologies are also getting to be different uh, from what we have 20 years back. And we believe that sequencing technology always dictating the algorithm developments. That's why some of the algorithms are no longer used, but some other algorithms are mixing some old techniques from the very old time with what we have today, including Minimap2, for example. You can see a lot of nice techniques already implemented there, but some of them already been used in the past because sequencing technology used to be updated, but also some of the similarities with the past we still have, especially sequencing errors. 
So until now, we still have sequencing errors. And the way we handle these sequencing errors are different among different tools. Some of them worry about that. Some of them, they don't worry about that. And they said, this is problem variant calling, for example, where you can include very high coverage data and then the problem might be solved. And also there are some other problems. For example, if you are sequencing the, the positive or what we call the forward strand of the DNA, how you can map the data also to the backward strand or the reverse strand of the DNA. Um, how you handle very large reads, but also how you handle very short reads on the same tool. So many tools are used to provide really different mechanism to handle that. For example, just a few example or a very simple example. In the past days, like 20 days, 20 years ago, we were also indexing the reads, not only indexing the reference genome because the reads used to be very short or within 30 bases or 15 bases. This is what we were getting from the sequencing machines. And indexing those reads, sounds to be helpful because they were very short. So you extract only a few cameras, few subsequences, one or two from each read, and then you build hash table out of the reads. But now no longer is viable or doable because the reads are now way longer than what we have in the past. Uh, but it, it will be interesting to see all these things and um, whether the old mechanism we were applying in the past are still applicable to these days. And I already gave a nice example where old algorithm can be still be useful, especially in our work called Genasm, published in Micro 2020. Um, in that work, we use a very old algorithm, was proposed in the 70s, so 1970, called BITAB. And that algorithm no longer used for the last 40 years or so, but we see really nice potential for that algorithm for 3D stack memories. And was one of the good candidates for there, since you can parallelize a lot of things over there compared to dynamic programming algorithm. Uh, but it was missing a step called backtracing, which is very important for genome analysis. And we proposed something to solve that as a workaround. And it sounds to be like really was a great candidate uh, to be accelerated on these three D stack memories. So even a very old algorithm can be still useful even for today. And this is what we are trying to cover in this paper. And we got very good positive uh, feedback from the community about that work. This is Genasm, the work I mentioned. Uh, you can access the video, uh, the slides, uh, and so on. But also we have GenStore. Um, hopefully we will cover some of these topics in the computer architecture uh, course. We will give full lectures on each of these papers, or at least the most recent ones. And GenPEP, which is very recent uh, paper from our group, we presented two weeks ago or three weeks, I think now, which was published in Micro 2022. And um, we have CGRAM, the first accelerator for pangenomics or uh, graph-based mapping. And this is Genasm again. And we have some more work on near memory processing, including uh, some microbiome profiling and acceleration of wavefront, which is the most recent and the fastest algorithm for doing sequence alignment uh, so far. So we accelerate this on the first real hardware or processing in memory hardware that is called Upman from a French startup. We have also many other pre-alignment filters, Sneak Snake, for example. It's, it's still the fastest and the most efficient pre-alignment filter for read mapping or genomic analyses. And Sneaky Snake is not only for read mapping, you can still use it for any application where you require to check the similarity between two sequences. It could be anything, metagenomic profiling, for example, uh, or many other uh, tools that may require you to check similarities between uh, sequences, for example, multiple sequence alignment or containment search um, and so on. So the application are um, not limited to any uh, uh, any uh, specific uh, pipeline, basically. So there are many more works. Uh, hopefully, I covered some of them in the previous lecture. All the source code of these works 
are really publicly available on our GitHub. You can access them, download the code, get the data. Hopefully they are well documented enough to do all the analyses yourself in case you are curious to improve, change something here and there. And also the papers are also available on archive in case you have a problem in accessing them. We provide a lot of lectures on different aspects of the steps that we are doing. And every time we publish a paper, we try to do a comprehensive lecture or a seminar on the, in the paper covering everything. And we are open to discussion questions in YouTube normally or Zoom, uh, especially from the people outside ETH. So I would recommend everyone try to access these lectures, which are publicly available, the papers that we need to do, which are a great resource for everyone, I hope so. All right, that was it uh, for this course. Hopefully I covered the logistics, the responsibilities that you need to uh, hold as a student of this course. And hopefully we will have a very successful uh, semester or a very successful course, uh, especially with the projects. Uh, we hope all of them uh, will be completed on time and the student will pass the course, basically. Um, uh, we still have a lot of work to do with the projects, so um, let's see how it goes. We have about 10 weeks uh, to complete the projects. And um, unfortunately, we cannot provide more information about the project for outsiders, but uh, hopefully we will cover them once we complete them. We may give you examples on the things we were working on in the previous semester. That was it. Um, thank you so much. Um, um, see you in next week and same time as today and also on Monday, 4 p.m. So have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.